Start us off, Callum. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to CastPod. And one thing you all know about CastPod is that we are creative. We are original, and everything we do is our own. And so today we're going to start off a trend where we copy ideas from other people uh, because it's about time. You know, we've put in a ton of work with our original ideas. It's about time other people start giving back. And uh, we're going to start that off with our friends over at Disney Desk. We're going to take an idea from one of their episodes and put our own little cast pod twist on it. Kevin, would you like to introduce it? Sure. Uh, so the Disney Desk podcast, co-hosted by Carter, who's also in this chat somewhere. Oh, hello. A You'll couple, be here. A couple of months to more ago, they mm -hmm. did a Halloween special where they talked about favorite Disney villains and had a bunch of categories for them and stuff. And secretly off to the side, if you follow their Patreon, you'll see them play the Smasher Pass version of the villains. What? I said True. it has to be canon. Um, <laughs> no, it's not canon. No, it's gonna happen. no, please. I don't want to get to it. If people buy our Patreon and look for that and it's <sighs> not there, we can get the FTC will be up our butts. Well, uh, that seems like not a me problem. Uh, <laughs> no! So being the original geniuses that we ha are, we're going to copy that <laughs> and put it uh, yeah. And Like Callum said, we're going to change it up a little bit due to poor recollection abilities of things that were said about 30 seconds before. And, mm -hmm. you know, just to make it, just like in school, you want to you wanna follow the assignment or follow your friend's assignment, but you want to change it just enough so you don't get caught. And that's, that's right. how I passed. Right, Callum? That's right. <laughs> so, so, Carter. Mm-hmm. What are our categories? All right. So these modified categories are brought to you by Kevin. Our first one is most successful Disney villain, who in their villainy effectively achieved their goals in villainy. Best song. You know, uh, most the most iconic Disney movies are all musicals, and the 90s had no shortage of great Disney villain songs. Most stylish. This can be fashion sense. This can be look or vibe or color palette or just animation style. Overall favorites. That is personally who you like the most, self-explanatory. Most underrated, the one you feel like people need to put in the canon, needs to put in the big wigs alongside Maleficent and Gaston. And who in this category I really like, and I kind of wish I included in my actual episode, who isn't evil or bad? Like, who gets a bad rap? Who got the short end of the stick? And when you see their argument, they're actually the good guy. Or at least not evil. Excellent. Mm -hmm. All right. So, Carter, you want to <laughs> lead us off with the your pick for the most successful? So it's who succeeded in their evil plots the best? Hmm. Okay. So, for the record, I think I'm going to try and do different answers from what I did on the original episode. Because that's that would be boring. You've already, you know, you should have all already listened to that episode. Or you're about to go listen to it. Or hmm. you're, exactly. So this is going to seem like a weird one, considering how it ends. But my answer is going to be Jafar from Aladdin. I was so, going to say that, too. Really? Yeah. Oh, oh my god. But please, so explain. Funny. Well, because his whole thing is he wants power. He wants to be the most powerful person in the room at any given point. So most of that energy is put toward being the sultan. And his shortcut to get that is getting the genie's lamp, which he ultimately gets. He becomes the sultan. Then he realizes, no, no, wait, I can do better than this. I should have magical powers. So he becomes a wizard. And then, even though he gets kind of tricked by Aladdin, objectively, Aladdin gave him what he wanted. He's a genie. He's the most powerful being in the entire Arabian Nights canon, like, universe. And yes, that means he's trapped in a jar, but as we saw in Return, to Jaf Return of Jafar, the minute he gets out, he's able to cause problems again. He effectively succeeded. He is the most powerful being in the universe, just in a tiny, tiny living space. Yeah, pretty much. 
That's exactly what I was thinking. It was like he wanted to be the sultan, and then he did that. And then he wanted to be a genie, and then he did that. It's just that genies get trapped in lamps, and he did. Yeah, he achieved his goals. Like, Mm -hmm. he's pretty (laughs) successful. Right, Kevin, what is yours? All right, you ready for the right answer of the best Disney villain? Hit me. All right, so let's let's start off like the villain typically does something bad to for the plot of the movie, correct? Mm-hmm. All right, I have mm-hmm. your agreements. That's so. the textbook definition of a villain. Excellent. I'm glad. My most successful Disney uh, villain is the hunter from Bambi. You oof. <laughs> Think what is about wrong it? with you? Think about it. His goal. It's true. I mean, outside of making children sad, his goal <laughs> is to go out, kill a deer, and get on, go on his way. And what did he do in the first chunk of the movie? And he set Bambi up for, outside of a life of therapy, the entire rest of its movie. The movie Bambi wouldn't have happened without the evilness of the hunter. He right. wasn't only successful for himself, but the entire franchise. All right, here's my question for you, and I'm asking you this because I'm not, like, I don't eat wild game. I don't really eat venison or rabbit or bear, and I know you have more of a robust palate in terms of those things. Like, I'm assuming he hunted it to eat it, or maybe he put it, hunted it just to put it on his, like, to put the deer's head on his, like, mantle. It was a doe, so odds are it was more for food than for trophy. Is fem- is doe meat better than male deer meat? In my opinion, there's no significant difference. Um, nowadays, I don't know about back when the movie was created, there are laws and place and like regulations so you don't kill does year round to help the population. Mm-hmm. However, there is like a cup a weekend, maybe two, a uh, hunting season where does are fair game to help keep the population under control so they're not as big of a hazard to cars, people's right, property. Right. I was worried I was going to get shot during one of those periods. Have I ever talked about that? Mm-mm. Uh, I was going through uh-huh. a wilderness area near our house that had a sign up like, hey, certain weekends there's going to be hunters. And I see a guy like uh, prone aiming at something and i'm like oh fuck my life did i get the days wrong and i'm like how do i approach this person in a calm and reasonable manner as so he won't immediately whip around and shoot me straight through the stomach it turned out it was a photographer everything was fine but yes by that standard can say like if we're using that standard where the meat is basically the same yeah i would say he's sick well that's a good one yeah that's a that's a good point All right, so the next category. Wait. Oh, oh Cal, I thought you were going to just continue with Jafar. Or did you no, I do. One? I do think Jafar is a good one, but I had another one in mind, too. Ooh, nice. And that other one is Scar from The Lion King. Now, you may think, well, hang on. He died, spoiler alert. But he That's did what? accomplish what he wanted in that he wanted to rule over the pride, similar to Jafar, even though it was short-lived, it wasn't that short-lived. Scar was in he- was the head of the pride for like several years. I mean, I don't know how much time exactly passed in Lion King from when Simba was a cub to when he's like an adult, but that's a good chunk of time and enough time that we saw in sequels that he had like kids. Right. And like a whole like following of other lions that were like, actually, we like Scar. We think he he is a good leader. Like he made he literally made his own like section of pride that left after you know he died and Simba came into power. All right. So like he had a following and he was running the pride and he had kids. So so to ballpark based off of how long it takes for a lion to mature. And- yes. I was hoping you'd bring that up. The of Simba's mane that he has. That's 
roughly a five to six year span. Like I would say being generous five to eight year span mm -hmm. of him having full control. And that's longer than Jafar was Sultan for. So, I mean, that's pretty good. Hmm. Okay. Even though he died, you know, like, he, he still got pretty much everything he wanted. It's just he died a little earlier than he was planning. But also, he was already pretty old, probably. Yeah. I mean, he was right. at least five to eight years old when the movie started. Mm -hmm. Lion's lifespans aren't crazy. Here's my nitpick for that, though. Only because... Although, I guess you raise an interesting point by um, mentioning the uh, the sequel that he had supporters. Mm -hmm. Because what we see in the movie is the pride is kind of going to poop. Like, everything's dying. There's no food. Everyone's kind of turning on each other. Yeah, And I guess my argument would be, it's weird that he wants power so bad, but doesn't really seem to have a coherent plan for when he does get it. You well, know, yeah, but... they say, I'm a dog chasing a car. I wouldn't know what to do when I got it. <laughs> that, that, oof, that was... I mean, he was part. surrounded by lady lions. Yeah, he like he... King. He wanted to be in charge. He didn't want to make the pride better. He and just wanted to rule charge. it. So, like, even though everything was falling apart around him, he was like, I don't know, go search elsewhere. I don't care. Like, I'm just living my life right now. Also, okay, you know what? That's a pretty good argument. Um, honorable mention for this category, like, with Calm's logic of, for Skarov, they succeeded. Mother mm -hmm. Goffle. She kept, like, outside of finding the flower and keeping herself young, she kept Rapunzel hostage for what sixteen to eighteen years. Yeah, like, like she right. she had a good thing going for her for yeah. a long time. And if she just let the kid run around in the grass in the area, or like tell her, "Ah, oh, your birthday's a different day," <laughs> she would have been even success more successful longer. It's it true. is weird now that you say that. Why would she not? Because like. Oh, they like the minute Rapunzel finds out. Oh, they like the lanterns because their princess went missing on her birthday. You have to think that raises at least one or two questions. It's weird that she did not just make a lie about her birthday. Yeah, easily could have. Oh yeah. Um. Yeah, that's a good one. Also, have you guys watched the animated Tangled series at all? Not in the no. series. They embellish on her a lot in some interesting ways, and. Um, someone made a, I don't remember what critic said it, but they made a good point. It's like, the, it's like when you s embellish on f at happily ever after it inevitably turns into final fantasy nonsense, but the tangled series was the good kind of final fantasy nonsense. Hmm. All right. Okay. Like All right. Topic number two. Who has the best song? Hmm. All right. I'll let one of you guys go first for this one. Kevin. All right, so I brought this up at the time of listening to it, and or I brought it up after recording for a cast pod Disney Desk crossover episode. You should check that episode out. Um, mm -hmm. We're going. We're going to the stretch ends of the Disney properties. Mm -hmm. Oh no! That's right. We're going to the Spider Pig song. Oh, just, oh my god. Yeah. You want to just <laughs> you could litigate this Just more. like the Hunter and Bambi. The events of the Simpsons movie would not have happened without Spider Pig, Harry Plopper, dealer's choice on name. Mm hmm mm hmm And if if I'm correct from the definition from earlier this episode, Carter. A villain can do something to cause negative actions to, for the rest of the movie. And wasn't it his pig crap silo that was the one that kind of started the chain of events of it going I mean, out? you could say it was more Homer, though. Okay. He did contribute. He did like, contribute okay. to the silo, and he put it there. The pig wasn't put it there. 
that a lot of my definitions for these things are like film school very like rigid and like textbook because it's how you know people learn how to write stories mm. so you can argue that you can argue you can make the argument that villain and antagonist is different antagonist is whoever directly whoever directly gets in the way of the protagonist's like core objective and for the simpsons movie i would argue that's ned flanders because the arc of homer's story is being a better dad slash husband and ned flanders is presented as the cool alternative to that but because you made the high Coco. But yes, Spider Pig is in fact a villain in the sense that his problems help trigger the events of the plot. He helps create the problems that we face in the movie. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. Because then the real villain is the EPA. Which, eesh. Pull my Which, coat, uh, my... It was kind of cringe when Ghostbusters did it in the eighties, and it's even cringer in the twenty, the two thousands. <laughs> All right, and if that one doesn't count enough, um, I mean, there's a platypus that. control in me by Doctor Doofenshmirtz, highly underrated. He's underneath the table. Say what? <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, Callum's turn. All right, so mine are a little less uh, creative, let's say. Um, I would say my no- I have a few different choices for this one, but I'd say my number one choice is Jafar. Be prepared, not Scar. Sorry, Scar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm looking at I'm looking at the list. Jafar famously doesn't get a song. Where Scar gets, like, a is Scar is right under Jafar, and so I messed up. Scar, be prepared from the Lion King. That was going to be my, my number pick, one um, until I thought of the Spider Pig conspiracy. However, I also like uh, Mother Knows Best by Mother Gothel. Um, and then honestly, Count Frollo is kind of clean with oh, it man. in his song. He does such a good job. Yeah, and like also, don't blame him. Esmeralda is kind of a baddie. Yeah, it, I mean, as someone who is still pretty attached to their faith, it is the, I mean, it's the struggle of faith where it's like, you know, you have to be pious, you have to be pure, but then a Romani baddie wearing no shoes rolls up and starts dancing on a pole, and you're like, Homana. <gasps> Awooga. Yeah, your your eyes turn into giant spotlights, your tongue rolls down, you start shooting steam out of your ears. The you whole the whole night nice slot machine. <laughs> Happens every time. You turn into a firework for a minute. <laughs> um yeah, that like I feel like I feel like Frollo is like the quote unquote right answer. Have you guys seen any of the they adapted it to stage, and it's never come to Broadway for a number of reasons I fully do understand. Um, but yes, it is even that scene is even cooler when you have like a huge choir of people physically in a room, and they also give Esmeralda a song for a change. Yeah, oh, that's nice. Honestly, uh, yeah, I think Hunchback of Notre Dame is highly underrated uh, out of like the Disney movies in general. Like, super um, underrated. That whole era of like there was like that era that was like basically post Lion King. It was like Pocahontas. It was like Hercules, um, Mulan, and Hunchback. Not specifically in that order. Other than Pocahontas, the entire era I feel like are kind of reclaimed as like no, these were all kind of good. Yeah, by far. It just the, didn't the Disney mold. The best part of Hunchback in Notre Dame is when the gargoyles build a catapult. And they pull the lever to launch it, and it just flops off of Notre Dame. <laughs> they're like, they're all high fiving like, that it worked. <laughs> My favorite line is always, uh, "Oh, this is a disaster." You're telling me I'm losing to a bird, and it's one of the guard <laughs> boys playing <laughs> Texas Hold'em with a freaking pigeon. Underrated. Yes, exactly. Um, 
Okay, mine. Oh, I have a couple different ones. Um, I was going to say Quilla DeVille's song because I like that she doesn't sing it. It is a song about her. I think it's fun in universe to have a lore song about yourself. Um, and I, I'm like, everyone kind of forgot the Quilla DeVille live action movie because they announced it right after Melissa and then it took a decade to finish. Oh, um, yeah, that thing. I, I would be so curious why they dragged their feet on that so long. But anyway, like, I like that they kind of followed the Maleficent thing of like, oh, this is what really happened. And the fairy tale version is kind of like a anti-feminist sort of propaganda piece. And I like that, like, basically in the live action one, it's established she was never going to hurt the Dalmatians. That was all just a red herring to mess with her rival. And at the end of the movie, she donates those Dalmatians to the couple and he starts playing the song, Quilla de Vil, and you're like, oh, so that's how the story came out. But my actual answer is Oogie Boogie's song. Um, mm. Because what is more evil than kidnapping Santa Claus and immediately being like, who the fuck is, who are you? What is this? Why am I supposed to be intimidated slash impressed by this fat loser? He's bald. He's old. I'm t he literally spends a whole song dunking on Santa Claus. Like, like it's the Washington, like it's the Washington generals losing to the Harlem Globetrotters. It's a very True. deep cut there. <laughs> it's not that deep. Everyone watches that. <clears throat> that movie kept Hot Topic alive for like five years. Yeah, it did it. And, um, I'd argue Space Jam kept it alive more out of basketball movies. Uh. <laughs> All right. Um. The first cast pod original topic. Oh. This one shouldn't be considered bad. <clears throat> or <clears throat> yeah, that's a good one. And you know what, Carter, you go first because we hijacked <gasps> your show. True. Fair enough. All right. So here is mine. This one is a bit of a wild card. Um, Auto, the AI computer running the spaceship in Wally. I thought about that one, yeah. Alright, hit me with it. Sell me. So, his... Okay, so... Well, one, he's a parody of 2001 Space Odyssey. But mainly, his whole deal is... It's his job to keep the ship afloat until a time when mankind can successfully... Ret like, Earth is able to produce life again so they can return to Earth and start rebuilding. And at some point, Otto decided, Wait a minute... Mankind is never going to be able to re like restart Earth. They already destroyed it once, and since they got in the ship, they've only embraced their sloth and greed and gluttony even more. These people will almost certainly die if I let them off this ship. So we are just all staying on this ship forever and ever. And you know what? I don't disagree. <laughs> I think that is a reasonable, like, not even just in, like, real-world politics, but looking over the scope of the movie and seeing how they're all wheelchair bound now, like they literally do not have full control of their legs anymore. I would argue Otto is correctly reading the room and saying, I don't know if I trust these people to not burn the planet to the ground again. All right. Yeah. That's very fair. Yeah, I totally thought about that when I was thinking of mine. I'm like, honestly, Otto, like... Maybe he kind of had the wrong idea, but I feel like he was like Wally was the optimistic one, and Otto was just like the realistic one. Where he's like, "You think these guys are going to be able to fix things? Yeah. They just are like, like they didn't even try. They just dipped, and like nobody's yeah. tried since. They all just got fat and started sitting in chairs. And like, you know, why? Why do I think now that there's a plant?" They're just gonna suddenly be like, "Oh yeah, we're gonna, I don't know, work out and become farmers." Like, no. Yeah, it's the most jaded, bleak version of like the climate debate, where it's like, "Oh, the people in power are literally going to wait till the eleventh hour, and throw some sci-fi at it." Like, and if I'm an AI whose job is to study human behavior and assess situations, how would I not just be completely jaded and disillusioned from that? Whereas Wally is raised on, like, pop culture and watching movies. So, of course, he has this starry-eyed, like, oh, it can work. Yeah, that's a good choice. 
I'm not even the hugest Wally guy, and I'm like, yeah, there's a reason why it's one of only t- like three animated films in the Criterion Collection. All right, I understood like two of those words. <laughs> I'll go on a rant about that on a different episode. Uh, Callum. So, this one's a bit of a deep cut. I did mention it. Um, my choice is a bowler hat guy from Meet the Robinsons. Yes, Cal. Well, that's <laughs> Yes. Yeah. So, if you don't remember, in Meet the Robinsons, there's this guy who is just called a bowler hat guy because he wears a bowler hat. And he's your classic-looking, like, sneaky villain guy where he's very tall and skinny. He's got a big mustache. He's, and he's always mustache. creeping around. He's got, like, an arched back at all times. But you find out by the end of the movie that Bowler Hat Guy is Goob. is Goob, his old roommate from the orphanage or whatever. I don't. And... I'm sorry. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. You mean the classic of everybody hated me. Hey, Goob, they all made fun of me. I like your folder. <laughs> exactly. I'm not saying it was all bad. I'm just saying it's a stupid fucking movie. <laughs> But what about the classic line of the T-Rex saying, I have a big head and little arms. <laughs> I mean, that's literally... I'm surprised how much mileage they get out of, get with that out of Moon Girl, but I digress. It's so good. Uh. But we find out that Goob um, went on this evil, in quotation marks, because really he wasn't that bad. Like, he was he was kind of just bumbling around most of the movie, like not really getting much more done. more menace than anything else. Yeah, he was just kind of annoying. And it's all because um, he was really sleepy. Like, his, his roommate, I'm forgetting the actual main character's name, I only remember Goob. Um, oh, God. Uh, Whatever his face, Robinson. Mr. Um, Meet the Robinson. Yeah, the blonde one. Uh, he kept him up all night, and so he was really tired for his baseball Lewis. game. His name's Lewis. Lewis Robinson. And he missed the catch in baseball, and then he just thought that everybody hated him when really they didn't. But he was just, you, you know, it's used as a meme, but really he was just a, a misunderstood and arguably bullied kid he also who just turned out just bad. Understood the situation. He did. Yeah. So it's like, it's not really all on him. You know, there are a lot of just factors in his life that led up to him being kind of annoying later in life. But overall, he's a good guy. I respect that. I was going to say him, actually. Yeah. Uh, I, I wrote it down when you mentioned it because I was like, oh, I better play it safe and <laughs> pick this guy in case of Callum doesn't or write him down mm-hmm. All right, and then... I mean I respect it it's just that whole era of like Disney trying CGI or Tangled my brain just kind of short circuits <laughs> alright for mine I got a pretty pretty interesting take now that uh, Callum uh, to my main one, but according mm-hmm. to the list of Disney villain characters, Wikipedia, this guy is on the list, so he counts. Edgar Balth- uh, Balthazar from the Aristocats. The Aristocats. Mm-hmm. Think good about choice. It. You spend, That's actually a good one. Like this guy, he's considered the bad guy because he tries to kick out a bunch of cats. This man waited on this rich old lady back before old like uh the rich had like concerns for the the lower class but <laughs> also way before back when the rich didn't have concerns for the lower class um and he spent a crazy amount of time waiting on her hand and foot doing everything for her and you know there's probably some sort of like real sketchy things he had to do and I'm talking about like it's dark, gross. dark. Oh, yeah. And she goes, she's got this huge, luscious mansion, and she goes, "I'm going to give my entire fortune to my cats." <laughs> it's literally cat scratch, but the bad ending. Yeah. 
Exactly. It's Cat Scratch, but the bad ending. And it's like, <laughs> these things, they can't... Oh, I gotta rewatch Cat Scratch now. That's in my head. Um, <laughs> I agree. But it's like, these things, they poop in a box. Yep. So, I don't blame him for mixing up a little bit of creme de la creme a la Edgar. And yeah, because he would just continue to be their servants, but now they're cats. Yeah, he could just... Own, he could just take the property and still own the cats. Right. The cats aren't going to die. They can just live there. Yeah. If, if <laughs> they gave him the fortune and it's like, here, here's your fortune, just make sure to take care of my cats, I bet you he would have been like, sounds good. Yeah, he'd be like, all right, I was already kind of doing that, so. It is, it is kind of wild that in this generation that's very, like, rich, no one talks about, like, that lady is the embodiment of, like, capitalism gone wrong where someone can arbitrarily go like i'm leaving everything to my cats <laughs> and it's like that's fucking insane you could help so many people even not even if you give it to this one guy if you just gave it to like charity you could like change the world nope it's going to my cats yeah <laughs> like it's unhinged it's unhinged mm-hmm mm-hmm he, like, he, a lot of people don't, like, lose, per se, in Disney, like, movies and stuff. Like, typically, there's, like, a redeeming factor or something like that. This guy just lost, like, because, yeah. it's, like, here's, it's, like, she just looks at, like, the, the few constants that are in her life, and it's just, like, cats. There's something the about cat. them. <laughs> You're you're completely right, and I'm mad that I didn't think of that. <laughs> All right. Who's the most stylish, Callum? The most stylish. Or now this one. Do you like? Who passes this one, the vibe check? Uh, I do like vibe checks. This is a tough one, uh, because there are some very fine looking villains you know like a lot of these villains are rich and so they can like dress however they want some have some very unique styles and i i kind of have two choices which are not similar at all um number one stealing from carter i would say radigan I think Radigan is drift out. And yeah. also, do you know how hard it is to get a suit that fine when you're a rat? <laughs> like, to to find those clothes and get them all rat-sized and keep them clean in the sewers, like, that's impressive. And then my other one... Got a point would be Maleficent. Oh. I like the aesthetic she has going on and her weird horn hat that all ends up turning her into a dragon. So it's like just dragon lady clothes so she can go to the ball and then be a mythical beast at the same time. I think she looks great. Hard to agree on that. Mm-hmm. 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 Carter. Hmm. Well, that was my pick, so now I have to read. <laughs> Radigan or Maleficent? Radigan. I'm gonna say because I gotta get him in here somewhere because a part of the Disney decks, the Disney desks' um, reputation is being excessively pro the Princess and the Frog, Doctor Facilier. That man has got the drip. He's got a sure slick that. suit. He's mm-hmm. got a top hat. I love his design that he just looks very, very tired. He looks like a person who is basically being puppeteered by dark magic. In terms of, like, his eyes are very, like, he has bags under his eyes. His limbs are very, like, spindly that to the point they look kind of marionette-esque. And that's included in some of his, like, motion and also his color palette is great. He's got these like greens and purples and like deep, deep blues. Like 
his Disney song, um, when the end of his song is liter like it's basically a a a pitch on why hand drawn animation is cool, because like the minute. Um, the minute, uh, what's his name, Prince Naveen shakes his hand, the entire room disappears, and it's just a kaleidoscope of green and purple and strobe lights. It's like, that is style right there. He's got fire. Mm-hmm. Exactly. <laughs> like, if we're, not, if we're not going for this level of flair, the people. I knew he was going to come up at some point. Yeah. I had to. He, he was going to be a guaranteed, like, I'm going to show up in this episode mm-hmm. yes um although uh i guess my other choice would be the beyonder from moon girl only because <laughs> i'm very pro because he uses kirby dots literally and i just think Kir- uh yeah i just think kirby dots are like a cool aesthetic flourish um yeah and i also like, like that when he teleports and stuff he turns into geometry he's just a bunch of shapes nice <laughs> For my, this guy passes the vibe check. I like his style. Um, He's one of the few Disney characters that, or villains, that they talk about his ability to decorate. And Mm -hmm. typically it's with antlers. It's Gaston. Oh. Like, he's got the rugged woodsman vibe. Pretty Mm -hmm. solid color palette, like, for his clothing. He uses antlers in all of his decorating. They sing a song about him in a bar. How cool is that? Yeah. Like, who else are they gonna sing about? Like Billy. Like they could sing about Billy Joel or Gaston. Like, that's mm-hmm. pretty much mm-hmm. the options. Plus, he's got them gains. He do got gains. He's got a lot going for him. And the, the a lot of, song that describes it. If you look at a lot of the other like villains, it's like. You got Scar, who's clearly outclassed by Mufasa, and then Simba. Mm-hmm. Um, Corel Deville, Maleficent, uh, Dr. Facilier, Jafar, they're all like string beans. Mm-hmm. And then, like, he's got, he's got the gains, he's got a bigger ego than a lot of the other ones. Like, Prince John and stuff, like, they're like arrogant, but Gaston's like, I can back this up. We're gonna kill right, yeah, right. Plus, he would have lost the Gaines battle to the Beast, but then the Beast becomes Prince Adam, and through the power of friendship or something like that. Yeah. And that is the by far biggest like, uh, you hit your peak and you just dropped <laughs> like a rock. Yeah, Gaston could totally take him. And now yeah. uh, he's like, oh, I haven't been a human in years. Let me try and claw you. Ah, uh, did you just slap me? Ha ha ha, Gaston punch. <laughs> and then he swallows 12 eggs. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's just like, oh, I got to get one of the dozens in if you get if you catch my mm-hmm. drift. <laughs> For some reason, growing up, that was one of my favorite lines. Something about the line, and now that I'm grown, I eat 12 dozen eggs, and I'm roughly the size of a barge. It's got me every time. <laughs> Dude, that's yoked. Yeah, ma- literally. Man's biceps are larger than certain people's waistlines. It's it's you should be you can't like it, it like if you roll up to a sporting event with arms like that, the commissioner is going to be like, nope, nope, this is a He's balance issue. Tested. You can't play. <laughs> He's going to get <laughs> tested for drugs on the spot. That's what's going to yeah. happen. Um, also, another shout out. I'm a big confidence guy. And I like shiny objects. Tomatoa from. I was gonna say, I was, before we moved on to the next one, I'm like, I'm surprised nobody said, but you got it. Shiny. He's got his whole undersea, like, palace. Mm -hmm. And he gets to collect anything that's shiny. And then he goes, like, kind of a la Facilier, he can just go blacklight mode and be all glow. That's right. Which is funny because they're directed by the same pair of directors, uh, Mark Clemens. They did Little Mermaid, Aladdin, Hercules, uh, Treasure Planet, Mo- uh, Princess and the Frog, and Moana. That's pretty cool. Yeah, they're kind of like the OGs. They um they really were like the 
main guys in terms of like what is this disney renaissance of which we speak yeah they really kind of just hung around like the outside of that like but made bops you mm-hmm. throw an emperor's new groove and they would have made a lot of essential like underrated movies that movie that movie's history is actually kind of insane um it was basically like so what happened was what had happened was so treasure planet comes out and it's such a spectacular bomb disney just goes you know what screw it we're pulling the plug on the entire animation department and there was a movie called the emperor of the sun which was set in the same location as emperor's new groove and was this prince and the pauper sort of story and they're like this sucks you have oh two days to rewrite it or we're throwing it out and they're like what if we just make it a comedy what if we just do like a fun like whatever comedy and that's how tre- uh that's how uh the emperor's new, uh, new, emperor's new groove got created i love that for them right it worked out and it sucks because it's like that is successful but like the you know treasure planet was such a bomb they're like ah, eh, we don't plug Better than Atlantis. Yeah, I don't. I actually really don't like Atlantis. That's my hot take. <clears throat> wow. Like, that's an underrated classic. Too bad it's diarrhea. Okay. <laughs> I didn't think it was that bad. All right, that might have been a bit excessive, but you get. <laughs> no, yeah. All right. Who? Who's your favorite? Oh. I mean, personally, I gotta go with Scar right off the bat. Yeah, that makes sense. Big Lion King guy. Yeah, that's a that's a very you pick. But also, I I don't want to sleep on Yzma and Kronk. Oh yeah, because they're they're quality pairing. My spinach puffs. <clears throat> um, like right. so I mine would be oh sorry I, was say, I feel like they don't need explanations no, no I agree um, so I already said Dr. Facilier so I'm going to say someone different I want to say someone different for every single one so mm-hmm. I'm going to for this one go Radigan if you have not watched Great Mouse Detective <laughs> you need to get on it <laughs> literally Disney Plus has every single canonical Disney animated film there's no reason not to have seen it it is simply well, like the Disney Renaissance does not happen if the Great Mass Detective doesn't exist, which is funny because there was a whole drama originally. Okay, sorry to, to, to derail us again with Disney history, but short version is the original title of the movie was Basil of Baker Street because that's what the books it's based off of were called. Because the guy's the mouse's name is Basil and he lives on Baker Street, which is famously the street that Sherlock Holmes lives on. Um, but then, uh, Katzenberg, well, probably a bunch of people, but Katzenberg gets the heat for this because he gets the heat for every dumb decision Disney made, um, was like, ah, kids aren't going to know what that means. Let's just call it the great mouse detective. Everyone's going to get that. It's a mouse. He's a detective and he's great. And all of the animators were fucking pissed because they're like, that's so dumb. Why are we doing this? <laughs> so they posted, someone posted a quote unquote memo throughout the company. that's like, we're renaming all of our movies. Uh, so, like, Snow White was uh, the princess who hangs out with a bunch of dwarves. Uh, <laughs> the lady with a glass shoe. And it was, like, a really hot, but like, a hot, heated moment. And then it just quietly sets up the most successful era in Disney history. But anyway. I love that. Radigan, I wish they kept those names. Right? Dragon is a funny. rat who wants to live in mouse society. His plan is unhinged. He kidnaps a toy maker kidnaps the queen, and then forces the toy maker basically at gunpoint, or rather cat point, because he owns a cat, and he's going to feed people he doesn't like to the cat, to make an animated a automaton queen who will give Radigan power to rule over Mouse England. Bananas. He yep. is shaped like a triangle. He's, like, huge. He's big guy. He's, like, triple the size of any other character who the mouse rodent. Yeah, Him and like Basil are protagonists. Gaston. Exactly have this weird, like, jealous ex-boyfriend's energy, 
where they just really like getting under each other's skin and are just always very cutting. Yeah. Like he figures out that Basil is in and he's just like literally de-dressing him like, oh, this is such a cute attack. He's voiced by Vincent Price in one of his greatest performances. He just has this great drawl where he's like, ew, Basil. <laughs> when he finally oh, captures Basil... Yeah, that was pretty Stewie Griffin. Brian. <laughs> kind of. Hey, Brian. Stewie Griffin... Stewie Griffin is the dis- like is diet uh diet um Vincent Price. Um he finally captures Basil and is like, I couldn't decide what devious plot to finish you off with. So I did all of them. So he sets up a Rube Goldberg machine that will crush him with a bowling ball, shoot an arrow at him, shoot him with a regular gun, and also crush him with a mouse trap, all while photo is taking a picture of his demise. And then the final fight is this simply lit battle in a clock tower. They're in Big Ben. Basil's like running away, and Radigan has dropped all pretenses. He's running on all. And then they have like a fist fight where they're just hacking each other to bits. Great villain. Great film. Best film. Gotta see it. And that's where Basil slapped it and he was like, discombobulate. Exactly. Yeah, he does the whole mind palace thing, but it doesn't work because Radigan's just that good. Yeah, it's just too jacked. Yeah, it's it's not even the bit from the shirt, the Robert Downey Jr. movies where they can both do mind palaces. It's just like, no, I'm a jock, you're a nerd, I'm shoving you in a locker. <laughs> Good choice, great choice. Yeah. All right. I guess, uh, I think it's me, yeah, because, well, my favorite Disney villain is for sure... Room rule. Uh, Hades uh, from Hercules. Saw that coming. Yes. Yeah, I mean, he's amazing. He doesn't get it like a song, which is very sad. But I mean, he's so good. He's got James Wood as a voice actor. Does he really need a song? Not really. Just every like line that comes from Hades is just a banger. Like everything he does and says. It's just like, I love this guy. Even though I hate this guy, I love this guy. It's and, weirdly you know, the most accurate depiction of Hades that has existed in most uh, Western canon. He's just so perfect. And I mean, I also have to give a subtle shout out to Clayton for being like, just a, like, in the way that Hades, you love him, even though he's evil. Clayton, you just love to hate him because he's so evil. And like, they just, they both do a great job of being villains in different ways. But definitely Hades is number one for me. Callum, I do have some good news for you, though, <gasps> um, in regards to Hades' villains. So, not too long ago, well, pre-pandemic, so 10,000 years ago, <laughs> um, uh, uh, the public theater, which is a big theater, famous, it's mostly famous for being where Hamilton first started. Um oh. It, they decided they wanted, like, their community theater really wanted to do Disney's Hercules. And not only did Disney give their seal of approval, Alan Mankin himself joined in the production to write new music for it. And they gave Hades an R&B smooth groove song called Cold Day. And it is a very fun song. And they are now taking what they worked on there... Uh, it was performed in Central Park in that uh, Shakespeare in the Park uh, space they have. And it's now in New Jersey, basically doing it for a theoretical Broadway uh, jump. So Hades will semi-canonically have his own song soon. I love that. I love that for him. Yes. He deserves it. Yes. It's a very fun production. I, I got to see it when it was in Central Park. It, it kind of gets... Hercules better than I think the movie gets it mm. in terms of like oh this should be the Wiz like a sort of R and B jazzy groove a famous story um, and I mean, like Hercules in general like Hades is a fantastic villain Meg is a like perfect female lead and mm. Hercules is a guy that you can pretty much root for no matter what. So and like all the side characters, pain and panic, 
and Phil, like, there's just so much good about Hercules. Oh, absolutely. So now, our last category. I think oh, I'm wait, most excited I... for this. I said, like, I mean, mine was oh, smaller right. and there was Quick. nothing really to add. Right. Yeah. All right, last category. Most underrated villain in Disney. Who wants to start that one off? Yeah, I'll start it. Uh, most underrated is, in my opinion, Bellwether from Zootopia. Oh, <laughs> keeping it relevant to Disney Desk. Uh. It's keeping it a little relevant to Disney Desk, <laughs> but also think about it. She succeeded in her plan for a hot minute. She did. And she had the sheep and wolf's clothing thing, like, the entire movie and it hits you with a little bit of a bamboozle there mm-hmm, mm-hmm. keeps you on your toes it keeps you on your toes and then it's like it ta- it takes a second because she seems all sweet and innocent and then it's just like once she gets her power it's like to her power it's like wait a second <laughs> but judy's a damn good cop <laughs> And as we always say here and on Disney Desk, there are definitely some good cops. Uh, mm, uh, <laughs> <laughs> this was, it was only like one part to annoy Carter, but also <laughs> it's, I mean, it's not wrong. She does. She's a good villain. She's a good villain that doesn't get the same credit as some others who have hated for for a lot weirder. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. See, I don't wholly disagree with you. My problem is more like all the individual parts of Zootopia work. It's just it has the worst of neoliberal politics of like, hey, why can't we all just get along? Everything <laughs> out. The you know the the road of history always curves toward justice, and it's like, no, no, not even a little. Carter, I don't think you realize. Did you not see the Super Bowl? Jesus would want us to all be friends. I. I'd like to go on the record and say I genuinely don't remember that. There, yeah, there was an ad that was just like a bunch of like. Oh, no, I just um, I don't remember for outside reasons. Oh, right, 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 right. Yeah, because nothing gets edited here. <laughs> no, I was going to say I was pretty drunk. Oh, nice. <laughs> and I was focused on eating and trying to not go over the edge over the over the course of halftime and make it to the end of the game. I mean, I wasn't that much further behind, but yes, I remember that ad a little bit. Only because I was seeing them on YouTube launched, and I'm just like, this is... I was like, this is either the most milquetoast neoliberal thing, or it's some weird far-right group trying to, like, muddy the waters, and the latter ended up being correct. Um, <laughs> just like Zootopia. <laughs> just like Zootopia. Um, again, I like all the characters in Zootopia. Again, it's just unfortunate all packaged in this, like, box of turds message. <laughs> If you want to get your way, frame somebody. Yes, frame someone for race. Mm-hmm. That's how it works. Uh, Cancel culture is effective. Carter, what's your most underrated? <laughs> All right. So obviously, I can't do Radican again. So I'm gonna hit you with that uh, razzle dazzle, King Candy. Oh, uh, King Candy. Ralph. So I love the premise character. First, he just comes off as a he's this guy who is like he's the like matri- or he's like the patriarch of this candy racing video game this Mario Kart-esque racing game and he's established as kind of an ineffectual boo. There's that bit where he's like you wouldn't hit some glasses would you? And then Ralph just hits him with the glasses <laughs> and it's like oh that's, that's clever um, and well, it's funny, because when you're watching the movie, there's a bit where they talk about going turbo, and they established that previously in the arcade, there was a game called Turbo that was like a racing game, 
And it was snails. Yeah. Yes. And the idea was that that game got unplugged. The uh, like the main driver in the game couldn't cope, so he started to go into other games and ruining them. And then, of course, it turns out at the very end of the movie that King Candy is Turbo in disguise, <gasps> having jumped to this game to basically play camouflage, where he can, like basically be the king, like the leader of the video game forever. And I'm like. That's actually such a good twist that this villain is like a virus. He's literally a mm-hmm. video game virus who started in one game and has really been hiding in other games waiting for his opportunity to destroy them. Great. No notes. And then they made that second movie. It's all Which I can't. Yeah, he's alright. Not great. It has some good ideas, but... Um... I think it just, it was everything Disney all the time, and I think that just to everything. Well, I, once again, have a deep cut here for my choice, as we should, because they're supposed to be underrated. So, initially, I was thinking that I would choose Shere Khan as my underrated Disney villain, uh, because this is a big evil cat. Right? I mean, like, you could argue that, well, it's, I mean, tigers just want to eat people, and, you know, Mowgli's a people, so he's just doing his job. But I feel like we don't talk about Shere Khan enough. And I also like Ka, of course, the snake. Because mm. he sounds like Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> but, <a> <laughs> but my real choice is. Percival C. McLeach from The Rescuers Down Under. The Poacher. Because, mm. I mean, this guy, he's just a bad guy. <laughs> he's Crocodile Dundee, but like the negative version. Where he's just living in the outback, hunting everything he can see with his evil little goanna pet. And... He sees this beautiful endangered golden eagle that is for some reason the size of a plane. And he's like, yep, I'm going to kill it. And all of its babies too. Hell yeah, brother. I feel like, you know, we don't talk about him much. He's like Bambi's, like, mother's hunter in that he's just out here hunting stuff just for the fun of it. And he succeeds in a lot. You can see all of like his trophies, and you get into his house, and you see all these other animals that he has collected and was going to sell off or eat or whatever. But you know, we just we don't talk about it. Nor do we talk about Bruno. We don't right. talk about Bruno. He was also he pushed a kid off a cliff. So I, I mean, do. I do respect your pick in the sense of Cowan. Sometimes. Especially in this latest era of Disney, where there's been a big push to, like, not do the traditional villain. Do more like, oh, complicate people are complicated. I think there's something to being like, no, I'm just fucking evil. I like being evil. I like hurting people and being a bad person. Yeah. Um, I think that's an underrated, like, isn't it nice to just have, an, like, an uncomplicated bad person as your antagonist? Like... Puss in Boots, too. Exactly. With uh, John Mulaney. Yes. Um, I will say... The character's name. John Mulaney is the antagonist of Puss in Boots. Um, what's his name? Uh, <laughs> Not even oh, the uh, character, just John Mulaney. Yeah. Yes, it's just John Mulaney. And I will <laughs> say, if someone had told me going like because i kind of dragged my feet on watching that movie because i'm like i know i'll like it but like, i'm not gonna rush if someone told me because everyone focused on death in that movie like the antagonist death and i'm who like well, that's kind of cool yeah who ruled but like i was like okay but i've seen this before like i've seen this kind of thing before no one told me there was also a big goofy villain whose whole bit is i'm evil and i just want all the magic and he gets paired up with Jiminy Cricket, who sounds like my Jimmy Stewart voice, like a parody of Jimmy Stewart. Oh, like, oh, oh geez, Mr. Potter. Mr. Um, Potter. Exactly. Like, if you had told me that, and the whole bit is just, 
What if Jiminy Cricket had to deal with someone who is truly morally irredeemable? Like, if I knew all that going in, I would have seen that shit. I would have gone and seen it in theater, probably. You're an irredeemable monster. Oh, oh, what took you so long, idiot? <laughs> Great, love it. It's That's what Shrek needs to aspire to. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I like all of those choices. Um... Oh, yeah, yeah, that was the last topic. Uh, I know. Yeah. So let us know in the comments what you would choose for all of these. They're Every not going to be as good way. as ours, but, I mean, you can still yeah, say. Been, yeah, we'll, we'll still appreciate the effort, but, you know, your, your, your base compared to us or whatever new dumb internet term there is. No, we're based. They're cringe. Oh, right. Thank you. Unless what you subscribe, you and then, <laughs> then you're These totally are the terms villains paid. would use in the 21st century, Kevin. That's right. Maleficent comes out and she's like, you're totally cringe. <laughs> <laughs> but like as a dragon. Yeah. Which, you know what? Give me that Yeah, movie. but see, that would actually be cool. <laughs> give me that movie. Yeah. Just make it for me. Give, me. give me the funding and I'll make it. All right, give me some paper and pencils. I'll start animating. <laughs> All right, send us home, Callum, the rest of the way. Thank you, everybody, so much for listening. <clears throat> Please subscribe to the YouTube for more stolen content. We will continue to do this as long as it makes us successful. And we'll do some original things, too. At some point. Um, yeah, maybe. We'll see. Bye-bye.